All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to another Modern Wars 2 speaker series event. We'll, we'll host Max Brooks. I often say he doesn't need introductions, but I'll do one just in case uh, you're unaware who Max Brooks is, uh, the author of many books, uh, best New York Times bestselling book, World War Z, which was later made into a movie, which Max has told me has a really great title. Uh, <laughs> Max is not only a trusted friend of the institution, but he is a non-resident fellow for the Modern War Institute, so he's written for us. He comes graciously all the way out here to speak to cadets. Um, but he's sought after heavily by the military for not how to kill zombies, but how to prepare for any complex problem. And he will change people's minds on the ideals of creative thinking, innovation. Uh, and I've loved every time he's come to talk. On top of the, being a non-resident fellow for the Modern Wars II, he's also a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council. Um, you can see his articles, his podcasts on our website, um, but not just on ours. With that, I, I won't hold it up. There will be questions and answers afterwards, and after he talks, and make sure you wait for the mic so that we can get it recorded. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, for starters, who here has heard me talk last time? Who was here at my last one? Okay, uh, for those of you who haven't, let me just do, I'll do a, a quick synopsis. What I talked about last time was the need for creative thinking. And that is critical in the world we're living in right now because things are changing at light speed. And when you get commissioned and when you find yourself in a situation, what we call now uh, a situation other than war, and what I mean by that's any kind of conflict. It could be humanitarian, it could be sectarian, uh, things are going to change on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis. Uh, the technology is going to change. The rules are going to change. The players are going to change. Whoever is going to be your ally one day is going to be your enemy the next and vice versa. So it is imperative that you develop that creative mindset. But what I'm going to talk about today is just as important. And it is the courage to champion creativity. What I mean by that is it's great to have a great idea, but once that idea happens, it's like a child. Once a child is born, it has to be raised, and it takes a village to raise that child. You have to be that village. When a good idea comes along, if you don't get behind it, it may not be your idea. It may be somebody else's, but if you recognize it as good and you don't get behind it and champion it and go to the mat and take a risk, that idea is going to go away. And that happens all the time. And this is, this is not just a military problem. This is a human problem. Because we have no support system for courage under pressure. We have a lot of support for courage under fire. You're being trained for this right now. It doesn't matter which army you're from. It doesn't matter what time you lived in. From the earliest days of war, even back to the earliest days of human beings, when we were primitive Stone Age tribes going out on our first mammoth hunt, we had to psych people up to suppress that basic human instinct for survival. And you're being trained for that. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons that your training is, I mean, who, any first year cadets? Okay. First year? All right. This is one of the reasons your training is so repetitive. It's not because the army doesn't have anything better to do. It's literally so they bake it into your brain. So when the shooting starts, it just switches on. It's one of the many, many things that they have done and are doing to make sure that that natural DNA in you that says, oh my God, is pushed away. So a lot of training and a lot of support for courage under fire. But there's nothing for courage under pressure. And this is really important because you're going to take as much of a risk if you champion a revolutionary idea. It's not going to be a physical risk, but it could wipe out your career. And you all know, I think by, at this point, no matter what year you're in, you know that the path to promotion is as narrow as a katana's blade. And if you make enemies, and if you ruffle feathers, that oak leaf, or that eagle, or that long sought after star is going to go away. 
And that's when you need the courage to champion these ideas. And like I said, this is not a military problem. This is a human problem. Remember, we are social animals. We are hardwired to fit in because in our earliest days, if you didn't fit in, you died. If you were an outlier, if you always spoke your mind, eventually your Stone Age tribe would be like, listen, we're going to go move the camp. You, you stay here. And then you would die. So it's in our DNA to fit in. And it breeds cowardice in our species. And if you guys want to see a nest of the most vile, conformist, spineless cowards in creation, come over to Hollywood. There's a whole class of them. They're called creative executives. And it's their job, literally, to say no to good ideas. Literally, they, they drive their Teslas up in their $1,000 jeans, and they sit there, and they go like this. Mm -hmm. And they hear pitches from writers or directors about amazing movies, and they go, yeah, we don't, we, we, we don't see it. We don't see it. Now, in all fairness, some of them don't. We can excuse the morons, and there's about 50% of them. But I'd say 50% actually get it, but are too scared to stick their neck out. Because if that movie goes down, they go down with it. But when they stand up for something, they cause a revolution. I don't know if you've heard of a TV show called The Sopranos. Now, let me just say this to all you young people. When I was your age, TV sucked. It, it was so dumb. It was either really cheesy sitcoms or it was boring procedurals. That's it. And then a guy named David Chase came around with his show called The Sopranos, and he pitched it to every network. And the coward said, I, I don't know, no, no, we don't see it. We don't see it. A shrink, but a shrink and a gangster. A gangster goes to a shrink, but it's not hilariously funny, like analyze this. It's sort of funny, but it's serious, but it's dark, but it's also really intelligent. We don't see it. One scrappy little network took a chance on it, and they called it The Sopranos and it changed television. It set a bar that had never been there before, and that's why we get Breaking Bad and The Wire and all these amazing good shows, to, you know, which our, our British counterparts are like, hey, you finally caught up with us. <laughs> yes, we finally caught up with you. Because that's what you get in my world, in the entertainment world, when you champion creativity. This is what you get in your world. This is the M1 carbine, one of the greatest weapons ever made. My father carried it in World War II. Eight million of these have been produced. Sixty countries have carried them. They've been through 12 wars. Six countries today still use them, including Israel and South Korea. Two countries, by the way, who have their pick of weapons and they only pick the best. And this weapon was invented by a bootlegger in prison serving a 30-year sentence for murder. His name was David Marshall Williams. And he was a backcountry guy from North Carolina, and he was brilliant, but he wasn't educated, and he got involved in moonshining, and the sheriff and his deputies showed up, and they got in a gunfight, and he shot and killed one of those deputies. And he went to prison. And in prison, he invented the blowback chamber for this weapon. And he's not the hero of the story. The hero of the story is the warden. The warden who, on one of his late night rounds, saw Williams scribbling on a piece of cardboard, which was weird because Williams had never written a letter home, and that's all convicts did. And he said, convict, what are you doing? And he said, well, I have this idea for a gun that uses the energy of an expended shell to eject the shell and load another one. So it's not automatic, it's semi-automatic. So every time you pull the trigger, you get another round. Now this is a murderer who shot somebody inventing a gun in prison. <laughs> Nobody would have faulted the warden if he'd have been like, oh, you got out your mind, 30 days in the hole. Because, <laughs> you know, we all saw Shawshank. You know, that's how wardens are supposed to be. You know, how can you be so obtuse? He was not obtuse. He was acute. He was so acute, he said to Williams, I want you to finish that schematic, and when you're done, I'm going to let you build a prototype with your bare hands in the machine shop using nothing but scrap metal supervised 
by prison guards and myself. And he let that happen. And halfway through the construction, the prison board found out. And they hauled him up. And they said, what are you doing? Because let's, if I haven't said this before, this was not liberal New York or California. This was North Carolina. And they said, what you doing? He making a gun in your prison. He going to try to escape with that gun in his prison. I'm not sure how he, they talked, but in my mind, that's what they heard. And you know what he said? He said, if that man escapes my prison using that gun, I will serve out the rest of his sentence. You want to talk about courage to champion creativity. He literally was putting his own life on the line. Because let's face it, you're the warden of a prison and suddenly you're the prisoner in that prison. You're not going to last very long. But that's how brave he was. That's how much he believed in this idea to champion it. And the story's not over. Because once he designed that prototype and had a successful shoot, suddenly all the gun companies were like, oh my God, you've got to pardon this guy. He can't be sitting in a cell. He's got to be working for us, making weapons to protect us. This was the 1930s. We knew another war was coming. We knew we needed the best weapons to put in the hands of soldiers. But who's going to let a convicted murderer out of prison? Who's going to vouch for this guy? The sheriff who took him in, whose deputy, Marshall Williams, killed. He vouched for him. He said, yeah, I believe in this. And then he had the courage to go to the widow of the man that he killed. And that widow said, well, let me just backtrack for a second. For 10 years, I've been running in military circles, and I've always been asking the same weird question. Why are we not learning from our enemies? You know, right after the fall of Saigon, why didn't we pay General Jap, who was the commander of the North Vietnamese forces, who beat us? We're the most powerful country in the world. Why didn't we pay him a million dollars as a tenured professor to teach right here and teach us how he beat us so then next time we would have a head start in having to play catch up? Why aren't there ex-Viet Cong and ex-Taliban and all the people we've gone up against. And I couldn't get an answer. And I finally got an answer from an FBI guy. I was at the Atlantic Council. I said, look, you guys, you guys hire forgers and convicts to work for you. Do you guys ever see um, Catch Me If You Can? Leonardo DiCaprio, right? He was the world's greatest forger. And then Tom Hanks was like, all right, come work for us. I said, how come the Army doesn't do it? He said, well, we don't hire killers. We hire forgers. We've never hurt anybody. You can't ask soldiers to sit in a classroom learning from someone who might have killed their friends. Well, to that I say that's very valid, but tell that to the widow of the man that Marshall killed. She could have stopped that cold. She could have said, no way, you're not letting him out. She could have led a crusade and just killed it. And she said, if it's for the good of the country, I will sign his release. And that is the story of what happens when you champion creativity, you get this. A lot of lives are saved. I might not even be here because of this. This weapon was so good, the Nazis used to try to grab them on the battlefield. The Viet Cong loved this weapon. All because somebody had the courage to champion creativity. And it doesn't stop with that. Our military history, everybody's military history, is fraught with these great ideas. And the creators get the credit, but not the people who agree with them. Last time I was here, did I talk about the Choctaw Code Talkers? OK, you guys, I'm assuming you've heard of the Navajo Code Talkers in World War II. Well, that all came about in World War I. These two Choctaw guys, who, by the way, were beaten in school for speaking their native language. That was the rule. If you spoke anything but English, if you spoke Choctaw, whap! And yet, they went to their commanding officer in the trenches and said, sir, if nobody on this continent understands our language, if you send him to another unit and we speak, those Germans can't break our code. Now, nobody would have faulted their commanding officer for saying, are you crazy? Get back in line. Because Native Americans at that point weren't even treated as citizens. They were not classified as American citizens. And so for a white officer to take that idea and say, that's good, I'm going to go before the man and I'm going to fight for that, 
He could have been court-martialed for that, but he didn't. And we got a code-talking system that went all the way up through World War II. Even now, and this is a big one, women in combat. It took, and I know where I'm talking to here, it took the Marines. Yes, I know, look, I, did, I, I get it. It took the Marines to say, wait a minute, 50% of Afghanistan is women. We can't talk to them. We can't frisk them. We can't search their houses. We need women in combat. To have to take that idea and face their fellow Marines, and then when the army grabbed it, to have to face their fellow soldiers? And that's a huge deal, ladies. Because let me tell you, I've written a lot of articles for the Modern War Institute, and I have never gotten the kind of pushback I got when I wrote an article, not about the future of women in combat, the history. I wrote this long history about women who've already served in different wars and what they have done from our Civil War to our Revolution to what Ivan did. Oh, my God. Women fighter pilots, women tank commanders. There's a woman sniper who had more <laughs> confirmed kills than any American sniper in any war. So I wrote this article, and wow, you should have seen the comment section. I, I've had kinder comments on, on Amazon for some of my books. <laughs> After Brad Pitt made a movie of it. <laughs> so for those soldiers and Marines to take that idea and then to face their fellow soldiers and Marines and to champion it, knowing that they might be ostracized, knowing that they might be isolated, and knowing that that star may twinkle out, that took unbelievable amount of courage. That's what happens when you champion creativity. Here's what happens when you don't. I grew up in the shadow of Vietnam. I'm not a, a baby boomer, I'm a Gen Xer, so I grew up in the 80s. And I grew up in the shadow of this horrible war that tore our country apart and that killed far, far too many of my fellow Americans. And what I always heard in the narrative of the Vietnam War was, well, you're sending conventionally trained troops into a guerrilla warfare with improvised munitions and mines and booby traps and snipers and ambushes. They weren't trained for that. Oh, if there had only been a book, if someone had only thought of a training manual for the kind of war they were going to be facing. TM-31-210, Department of the Army Technical Manual, Improvised Munitions Handbook, 1969. TM-31-200-1, Unconventional Warfare Devices, Techniques, References, Department of the Army, 1966. Guerrilla Warfare and Special Forces, 1961. Three years before the first Marines splashed ashore at Da Nang, 1961. All those ideas. But what about today? We can always say, well, that was a drafty army. You know, now we're leaner, we're meaner, we're professionals. We've been that way since the end of the Vietnam War. Things have changed, right? Can I see a show of hands of anyone who served in Iraq? Urban warfare, right? Were you guys trained for that? It was an urban warfare manual? Yeah. If only there had been. Combat in Hell, a consideration of constrained urban warfare. The Rand Corporation. 1996. These were all the lessons of Somalia that all of our guys had experienced in Mogadishu, right here. Was it perfect? No. But it could have been a start. But let's forget the past. Let's talk about the future. I do a lot of these military conferences. A lot of people with PhDs come in. You know, and the Army, God bless them, is very open to new ideas now. The Army is finally having, for your sake, the kind of nervous breakdown they should have had after the fall of Saigon. Now the Army wants new ideas and they're flexible, and they want to hear more. And they're hearing from all these people trying to talk about operations that are going to be other than war. Like I said in the beginning, what's going to be an insurgency? What's going to be uh, an environmental crisis? What's going to be food riots? What's going to be any time where there is violence, but it's not what we think of as a war? And everyone's acting like this is brand new. 
If only there had been a book. Department of Defense, United States Army, report of the Senior Working Group on Military Operations Other Than War, 1994. And in this group, this is some of the things that they predicted. Disaster relief, humanitarian assistance, evacuation operations, civil disturbance, peacekeeping, mobile training teams, peace enforcement, counterterrorism, counterproliferation. And here's some of the technologies that they called for in 1994. And anybody who served in Iraq and Afghanistan will know what this means. Mine, booby trap, and explosive detection and neutralization. This is the kind of technology they wanted for the Army in 1994. Anti-mortar, light indirect fire capability. Extremities protection, anti-sniper system. Imagine how many lives that would have saved if our troops would have had that before Operation Iraqi Freedom. They also called for something else. Tactical detection of weapons of mass destruction. Would there have even been Operation Iraqi Freedom? And at the very bottom, they called for universal, long-life, lightweight power source. Before 9-11, before all these wars in the Middle East, they called for a technology system that would have freed us from petroleum. And this wasn't some hippy-dippy in Berkeley. This was the army calling for this. All these good ideas, what happened? Now, obviously, it's a giant bureaucracy, as is everything else, as is any business, as is Hollywood, as is in any organization. So, you know, chances are a lot of these just fell by the wayside. But what if somebody with the power to do something about it? What if someone with birds or stars read these, knew that they were good, and didn't want to make waves, and took a step back and let that idea die? Ladies and gentlemen, you can't let that happen anymore. The world is way too dangerous a place right now. From the time you first get commissioned to the time you get that star, you're going to have good ideas thrown at you. And they're going to come from fellow officers, enlisted personnel. They may not come from the Army. They might come from another service. They might even come from the Air Force. We have an Air Force guy here. They come up with good stuff every now and then. It may not even come from the military. It may come from a foreign military. Britain, Japan, Spain. They have a military. They may come up with some amazing ideas. It may not come from any military on Earth. It may come from a civilian group. It may come from Doctors Without Borders. Or it may even come from someone in our prisons. The point is the ideas are there. The question is, are you going to have the courage to recognize and champion them? Thank you. We're going to open up for questions. Sir, uh, Cadet James Ryford. Uh, my question is, uh, World War Z is one of my favorite books. And uh, reading it, I notice a great deal of cultural awareness and a great deal of empathy to be able to enter in, in the minds of such a diverse cast of characters from all over the world. How, did, how does one, how did you develop that level of awareness and empathy when you were writing the book? That's a really good question. How did I develop that level of awareness and empathy? Um, part of it was from travel. I think that's very important. Uh, I mean, personally, I think that if I were uh, Secretary of Education, honestly, I would, I would ban all cultural exchanges to rich countries. I would make Americans have to go to countries where people are struggling and make them see what we have and appreciate it, or maybe learn from other countries. And I think, I think that's an issue. I think the problem is, you know, every country does something really well and something really not well. And we do some stuff really well. 
We're, we are great innovators. And we're great when we've been knocked down. We get ourselves back up. And we're great at uniting when everyone thinks we're going to be divided. What we're not good at is engaging in the rest of the world. We are isolationist. We are completely isolationist. It's been our problem since day one. You know, a half century ago, when my father was a kid and Britain was screaming for its life, we didn't want to get involved. And Franklin Roosevelt had to duck and dodge and do things like lend lease instead of saying, hey, we all live on the same planet. And that's been our problem. You know, sometimes you, you go abroad and you hear people say, oh, Americans, you are so imperialist. And I go, no, God help you if we were. <laughs> our problem isn't our imperialism. Our problem is we don't care. The first thing we do when we get to a country is we ask, when can we leave? We look at foreign policy like a booty call. You know, the minute we go in, we're just like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll call you. Yeah, OK, sure. And then we can't wait to get out, even though we've kicked over the anthill. This is our problem. We need to understand that we live with other countries, and what we do affects them, and what they do affect us. And that's why I put all that empathy into World War Z, because it is a world war, because we do live on one world. Anyone else? Next, um, for some of the cadets in this room who take, have taken military innovations, we take them every year to Google. And um, it's very interesting, because Google Obviously, very innovative and very um, a lot of creativity. Every week, they have a kind of a bitch session, essentially, with Larry Page, and you can literally criticize him. So it's a very horizontal uh, organizational culture. Here, it's quite the opposite. I wonder how the hierarchy of a of the organization. You mentioned bureaucracies, but how do you how do you instill discipline and have creativity at the same time? I mean, how do you? There's something in the um, you know. There's something here about you have to have people who have, you can't just have that session, you know, every, every yeah. week and it, all order would, discipline, uh, would break down. So I'm just wondering how you can uh, generate creativity from the, from the bottom up but also maintain some kind of hierarchy. I, I, think, I think that it's not one or the other. It's a really good question. How do you stay disciplined? Because you guys need discipline. You can't, we, it can't just be a free-for-all. You have to have that. That is really important. Otherwise, you're not an army. Otherwise, that's a mob. You know, if you look at how Rome conquered the Western world. How did little tiny swarthy guys like me go up against giant Germans? We were disciplined and they weren't. And you need that. But then how do you think for yourselves? And then how do you push back? Well, the answer is it, it's not all or one. There needs to be in an organization a time and a place to do that. Like at Google, they have their bitch sessions, but they don't have it every day. You don't just have some random millennial with his man bun walking into the CEO of Google every day being like, hey, dude, this is lame. No, there's a time and a place. You know who are actually masters of this? And it's killing me to have to admit it because one of them's in the room, the British. Now, I, now, we all think of the British as the sort of stodgy, yes, no, here, this, and you, and we, and here. And that's how they are. That's what, <laughs> see, which you're descended from. Anyway, um, <clears throat> they do that in certain places and certain times. But because they had an empire, and an empire that wasn't always connected by telegraph and before the telegraph, they had to have, as part of British doctrine, a lot of free thinking of their field commanders. Their field commanders needed to be able to think on the fly and to create and adapt and take the book and throw it away. And that's why when their empire was contracting, they were amazing at counterinsurgency. I mean, if you look at Malaya, what they were able to pull off with so few troops, because you know the American way is we need a surge. We just need more. We need more, more, more. They didn't have more. In the Mau Mau revolt in Kenya in the 50s, there was, what, 80 of you guys in the whole country? And they won. And they have won consistently because they've had that amount of flexibility. Because every field commander from lieutenant, lieutenant, sorry, from lieutenant up to general didn't always have to phone London or Whitehall to get instructions. He went. 
And they did it. Now, we're not like that. We're very top down. And part of that is communications. Part of that is by the time we stepped onto the world stage after World War II, we had telephone, telegraph, airmail. We could micromanage our troops in the field. And so, and you saw that in Vietnam. You saw that micromanaging, which got us into so much trouble. This is not the way we do things. It's also, I'm glad he mentioned the Germans, it's because our army is based on the Prussian model. After the Civil War, we became professionals, and we based it on the best land army we could think of, which was the Prussians. And that's where general staffs and war colleges and all that stuff came from, which is great, but it gave us a rigidity. And this is super important. Because the Prussian model of warfare, we should have known this. We should have seen this in World War II. The Prussian way of fighting was proven completely incapable of defeating an insurgency during World War II in Yugoslavia, when the Nazis could not defeat Tito. 20 years later in Vietnam, we kept saying, well, we just need more, more, more. And then a couple real hardcore guys said, we need to take the gloves off. No more of this Mr. Nice Guy. We need to do whatever we have to do and spill as much blood as we have to spill to make them fear us. It doesn't work. Tito and his partisans proved that because nobody had their gloves off more than the Nazis in Yugoslavia. But that rigid Prussian model did not work. So we can keep the same army that we've got, but we can then develop pockets and places where we can push back and we can be free thinkers and still retain the discipline and order that is our army. Anyone else? Uh, Sir Cadet Swinson. So you keep talking about operation over the war and how we use creativity in those. What if in the unlikely event um, we get involved in a global conflict? In, in World War Z, it's a global conflict. How will we apply uh, like concepts of creativity to beat, say, China or Russia, unlikely as that may be, sir? No, I think, that, I think that's a great question. Uh, I think that we are still going to have large-scale conflicts, but they're not the way we predict it. You could argue we're already at war with Russia. I mean, messing in someone's election, hacking, a cyber attack on our democratic process, that's not an act of war? To influence our politics that way? I think global wars are going to happen, but they're not going to happen the way we would like them to. It's not going to be like day one, we declare war, you guys get marshaled, you roll out in your tanks into the folded gap, or you deploy to Taiwan waiting for the Chinese landing craft to land. No, it's going, to be, it's going to be big countries using little countries or using non-state actors to have their influence pushed back or pushed forth. And you see it now in Europe. Russia is moving into the Ukraine. And they're using force, but it's not Russian tanks. It's locals. And they're doing that. And yet, they're pushing their influence west. And now there's talk in us about abandoning NATO. Well, then they, if that happens, if we abandon NATO, they win the 1980s World War III that I grew up with. They'll win without firing a shot. So we have to be aware of that, which still means we have to have a show of force. You always need that. I mean, it was a few weeks ago when somebody tweeted about Taiwan. They sent their whole fleet, the Chinese, right through the Taiwan Strait. Just, we're here. So we are always going to need these large forces, but they're going to be part of something bigger. Cyber, economic, cultural, intel. So yeah, the big conflicts, you could argue, are already happening. Anyone else? Sir, good day, Krishnan. Uh, going back to when you talked about uh, essentially the Prussian army and the failed rigidity, do the increase in the technology and how it's easier and easier to have instant communication with even smaller and even smaller units on the ground, how would one go about encouraging, or say, commanders or lower ranking officers to actually take control due to the fact that now procedure or doctrine states that, I mean, in any time you have the option to, you know, call higher up or something like that. I'll tell you that. exactly how we do it. In training, in live training, we do mock hacks of your communication system. Who is the general who just wrote about this? Was it? General Milley, yes, sir. Right. Well, 
he was just saying that in the wars of tomorrow, we have this great technology. We have this ability to basically network each individual warfighter with the Pentagon. But there's nothing to stop that being hacked. I mean, one of the things that we learned from the Russian hack of this election is that when you saw a lot of comment sections on certain websites, Democratic websites, uh, and, and they were supposedly from angry people in Ohio, they weren't. They were from Macedonia. There was literally groups of like Macedonian teens like put, that's, that's false information, that's false propaganda, and that's gonna happen in war. And it's not, when I say jamming, it's not gonna be like World War II where you're gonna be a platoon leader out in the field in Nigeria and suddenly it's gonna be like Echo Foxtrot Alpha, it's not gonna be like that. You're gonna be getting an email, you're gonna be getting some sort of message, coded, uncoded, that is going to tell you to do something and it's not coming from HQ. You think it is, but it's being routed from somewhere else and it's gonna tell you to do something. So there's gonna come, there has to be special doctrine that's gonna to have to be put into our training now where everything's gonna to have to go dark. Where literally, if I were doing a field exercise with all of you, at some point, I would just flip a switch and everything would go dark. Not dark because the enemy did that, because we had to do that because there was so much false information coming through. And you're on your own. And you gotta think for yourself. And suddenly, you are a Roman legionnaire in the Black Forest of Germany. That's how cut off you are. Or you're some platoon leader in the jungles of Malaya. Because everything, every step forward has a step back. And we need to have point counterpoint. So don't think that this amazing new revolution in technology is going to always take us forward. We have to bake in the safeguards. Anyone else? Max, I know you've been sought after for major level exercises to discuss post-disaster, post-war, in warfare, um, you know, almost like the 10th man, I know you're the guy that has, yeah. hey, did you think about this? As being around military, um, even strategists, even people paid to think, what are some of the things they often overlook? You know, it's funny, I think, I think what I have found in all the military conferences I've been at and all the strategy sessions, it, it's, it's not a lack of ideas anymore. All the ideas are there. Honestly, it's, it's a lack of courage. Now, Major Spencer, we met at a strategic studies group where literally, this is what gave me the idea, this is what, five, six years ago? It was a long time ago. You, you had little shiny bars then. I was speaking to a group of generals and I was talking about, remember this, I was talking about what, how we need to take care of our veterans and, and what needs to happen and when you talk to Congress, you need, and when they ask you questions, I said when you guys go up before Congress and they ask you the hard questions, you need to give them hard answers. And I remember one guy said, well, with all due respect, if we did that, that'd be the end of our careers. And I said to him, well, with all due respect, if, you, if your soldiers are willing to take a bullet, you need to take the heat. So I do think it's not so much a lack of ideas. They're there. It's, it's a lack of uh, speaking out and also a lack of rewarding for speaking out. You know, they give you a lot of medals. You, you, you look at Major Spencer, mm. no, nobody accuses him of being a wimp, okay? He, this all says, oh, that was dangerous, that was dangerous, that was dangerous, that was really dangerous. That's all physical courage but there's not one medal on there for speaking his mind and possibly risking getting passed over for promotion. I think there needs to be a system that rewards that because I actually saw that happen to a colonel friend of mine. I won't say what command she was from, but they were doing an exercise and she was in logistics and she ran the numbers and she said, if this were to really happen, we couldn't do it. The numbers don't add up. And she was told, it's fine, don't worry about it. But she was worried because American lives were at stake. And so she gave those figures to another command and they ran it. And she said, like, am I wrong? Maybe I'm wrong. Just, and they said, no, 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 you're definitely right. But by putting it on record, she had embarrassed her boss. And nothing bad happened. You know, there was no court martial or anything, nothing bad. But when she came time to be promoted to general, she got passed over. There's no reward for that. There's no reward for doing the right thing. 
for risking your career. Risking your life, yeah. And I do think there should be more incentives for risking your career if it saves lives. And I think that would be, that would be very, very beneficial. How much time we got? All right, listen. Uh, unless, does anyone have any more questions? Because I want to say one last thing. Anybody have anything else they want to ask? Nothing? Just, oh, yes, okay. Cadet Rosen, yes. Uh, do you think that the, the Army or the military as a whole is just generally too over-reliant on outsourcing to civilians to, or civilian think tanks in order to accomplish this level of thought you speak of, sir? No, I, th I, think, I think the Army's doing a great job of reaching out to other ideas. Because when you're trained in a certain area, you, it may just not come to you. No, I think what the Army's doing is wonderful reaching out to everybody. And, and this, is, this is wonderful. This is what should have happened after Vietnam. But after Vietnam, they said, oh, that, that was a one-off. We're going right back to our comfort zone and feeling good again. We're going back to tanks in West Germany. No, I think the Army now has, now has the psychology of a, of a freshman. And when you're a freshman, you're at your best. Because when you're a freshman, it's all open and you're ready to learn anything. And when you get to be a senior, you're like, yeah, all right. And that's what we wanted to feel like after Vietnam. Now the Army's like, we're open. We're open for business, which is great. Now they need to take the next step, find the good ideas, and fight for them. And that may not even be up the chain of command. That may be to Congress. That may be having, when Congress says, what do you need, having to say, Senator, I know this is expensive, and I know it's hard to ask the taxpayers for this, but this will protect their lives. This is more important. So I do think that, that the Army is definitely on the right track. They can just go farther. And I just want to—I want to finish up because I don't know when I'm coming back, and I don't know—I don't know how long this fellowship lasts. I don't know if it's just one year or what if I get rotated out. So this may be my last chance. So listen, this is this is something I wanted to say for a while, and this is really important. Um, do you guys know why you study things other than war? Do you know why you study history, philosophy, economics, all the big stuff? I don't know if anyone's ever told you, but the real reason I think that you need to study this is to defeat someone like me. And, and I don't mean me. What I mean is one of you, at some point in your long career, is going to end up in the Oval Office. And the president's going to be there. And on one side is going to be you. And on one side is going to be someone in a suit with five different degrees and languages. And he's going to be really smart. And he's going to understand war. But he's not going to get it. Now, if you don't know what I mean, there's a huge difference between understanding something and getting it. If you haven't been a parent, I don't care if you're an obstetrician, you don't get it. If you haven't watched your mother die of cancer, I don't care if you're an oncologist, you don't get it. I understand war. I've been studying it since I was a kid. I understand. But I've never been to war. I don't get it. You will. And you're going to stand on the other side of the commander in chief. And that man's going to make his argument. And it's going to be fraught with Thucydides and Milton Friedman. And he's going to make broad arguments for what he wants. And getting it is not going to be enough for you. You're going to have to meet him on his battlefield. You're going to have to throw right back every paper that he quotes, every book he's read, every language that he speaks. Because... He understands what war means, but you're going to get it, and that's going to be critical. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Sorry. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Please go to our website, nwi.usman.edu, to see the next upcoming events. If you're not following us on Facebook and Twitter, it's also the mechanism which we communicate upcoming events and daily articles by scholars such as Max Brooks. He will stick around for a couple more minutes, but we have to clear this room at 1345.